Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders in the battle against the coronavirus. The North Atlantic Trade Organization, more commonly known as NATO, is an intergovernmental alliance between North America and 30 European countries. And NATO has had a visible presence across a lot of the world during the fight against COVID-19. According to the alliance's Deputy Secretary General, NATO has conducted 100 strategic airlift flights, built 25 field hospitals, dispatched more than 4,000 medical personnel, and provided 25,000 treatment beds. And in the midst of that mobilization, NATO has been putting out a warning of a buying spree from China and been on the front lines when an F-16 fighter intercepted Russian jets. So stuff is still going on. NATO has also been fighting disinformation campaigns about COVID-19, the types of misinformation we have seen in other hybrid conflicts around the world designed to plant seeds of discontent and mistrust, driving societies apart. Joining me now to discuss all of this is Mircea Giona, NATO's Deputy Secretary General. A lot to unpack here. Welcome, Deputy Secretary General. Glad to get into this with you. Uh, so let's put this to rest. Let me just ask you about one of the misinformation bits I've seen online that NATO concocted COVID-19. So let me ask you straight up, did NATO create COVID-19? You know, um, the, I think the myth busters uh, have a lot of work to do. Um, of course, there was misinformation, uh, fake news, uh, all sort of uh, conspiracy theories, but we have seen an increase of such, you know, uh, attempts to discredit uh, what we do. Of course, it's false. It's not only false. It's so low uh, in terms of trying to portray, uh, you know, a serious organization like ours or the nations in the democratic West as being able to think of something like this, less so to, to operate something like this. It's just an outright lie. And we've seen, in, indeed, as you mentioned uh, earlier, a significant increase in uh, disinformation campaigns, in misinformation, in fake news, in hybrid, in cyber. So as a defense security organization, we have to make sure that one, we show solidarity with our, with our members and the one billion citizens that are under the NATO flag. 30 NATO allies, one billion people. Our first job for the last 71 years is to keep peace and to really have our citizens uh, operate uh, free and well uh, and uh, out of the harm's way. The second thing that we have to do is to make sure that our adversaries, our rivals, state and non-state alike, are not tempted, tempted to use and abuse of this pandemic to transform a health uh, problem into a security problem. You mentioned the fact that uh, NATO continues to be vigilant despite the normal measures to protect our personnel, to draw down on some of our uh, exercises or our presence, I want to, to, to reassure all of you and through you, uh, all your viewers, that NATO is fully functional as we speak. Our de defense and deterrence, in our jargon, the way to really make sure that all our defenses are up, be right. it in what it is our presence in Europe, be it what is our maritime uh, patrolling capabilities, air policing, like the, 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 uh, the, the topic that you have mentioned, our missions and operations from Afghanistan to Iraq all the way to Kosovo. This alliance is a unique uh, organization that is uh, at the same time showing solidarity amongst members, but also making sure that we continue to defend the one billion people that are our citizens. And we do this as we speak, right. uh, in very good and uh, fully functional conditions. Well, Machia, one of the, the things that I've been wondering about, NATO is, a, as you just articulated, a membership organization, and any organization is only as good as its members are. And, you know, the United States is a key member, has a staggering number of cases that it's dealing with uh, domestically. Uh, we saw the horror stories coming out of Northern Italy. Uh, we've seen Spain surge to be one of the second largest global hotspots. And so I'm interested in how NATO, as a strong military alliance, and I'm sure that you have military personnel who have been suffering with this awful disease, how have you been able to navigate the fact that this is such a huge load for your own members uh, internally, if you will? 
you know, in a way, it's normal uh, psychologically and politically for nations to try uh, in the first stage of such a massive shock to turn a little bit inwards and, and look after your citizens. In fact, that's what governments are supposed to be doing, to defend the citizens they are supposed to defend and, and represent. So the first stage was a little bit more in a, in a looking. But as we moved uh, a little bit more from this initial stage, we have seen, and, and we have seen here in NATO, a remarkable sense of solidarity re-emerging. We've seen uh, help to Italy coming from the US today, uh, as we speak, uh, a new contingent of Slovak medical doctors, civilian, and I think also military, are going to the rescue of, of our Italian friends and allies. Medical doctors and nurses from Albania, from Romania, are going uh, to Italy and, and, and to Spain. We've seen, as you mentioned in the numbers, a significant increase of inter-allied support. Of course, we don't have as NATO our own assets per se, it's still the governments, but because we are so good in uh, logistics, in a strategic airlift, uh, in command and control, allies prefer sometimes to use NATO because our efficiency is well proven in, in different crises. We are also very good uh, in what we call in generic terms resilience. We have uh, basic requirements, baseline requirements for many of the components of our economic and, 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 and social uh, fabric in our nations, that NATO is very good in, in, in doing this, in uh, infrastructure, in energy security, in civilian, civil military cooperation, in emergency situations. As we speak inside NATO, we are already beginning an upgrade of our re resilience package, making sure that we also move to the third stage, which is not only a gradual economic uh, reopening of activities and a gradual return to normal life, but also a process of lessons learned. Right. Because this is a pandemic, this is a major shock that has impact on us and serious governments and serious organizations like the one in the political West and, and also uh, in, 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 inside the, the world community, they are drawing lessons on what we should do next to be better prepared and respond together. Well, Look, I, I want to ask that you a, a slightly uncomfortable question. Um, I've been watching with admiration uh, stories about the Czech airlift of a million masks to North Macedonia, the, the movement by NATO, an airlifting of supplies that you make ventilators and masks from to places like Spain, uh, the coordination and the response centers, uh, the hospital tents, you know, all of the kinds of things that that you've been putting forward, and I've read the NATO information sheets, and, and it's impressive. And we're looking at the United States right now, and you used to live in Washington, D.C., and I have to say in Washington, the biggest debate today is about logistics. It's about resources at the right place at the right time. It's about testing kits and ventilators and who's in control, the states or the federal government. Our Maryland Governor Larry Hogan is being criticized by the President of the United States for buying 500,000 uh, masks from South Korea, an ally. And so I'm interested in, well, maybe we need NATO to come figure out, you know, how to run things in the United States. Maybe that would help us a little bit. But is the United States playing a constructively positive role in your logistics picture? Because it doesn't feel that we're doing that for our own selves here in the United States. Let me tell you something, and this is another, uh, you know, you know, a moment of, of pride for us. We see in all allied nations and also in many countries around the world, in these very difficult moments, our military personnel coming to the forefront of our common obligation to defeat and fight this, this, this damn virus. Uh, we see tens of thousands of military personnel from all 30 uh, NATO allies helping in, in, in putting themselves in the, harm, in the harm's way uh, alongside the civilian medical personnel, making sure that this, this infection, uh, that uh, even sometimes helping the local police or the national police or gendarmerie, in some cases in Europe, they are really stepping up their game. We are very proud of our military, of course, of the ones who continue to be in our missions and operations all over uh, Europe and also in the theaters I just mentioned, but also in, in, our, in, our, in our nations. My country, Romania, I'm coming from Romania. 
I was ambassador to Washington. You mentioned my days in Washington. I still remember with great, great fondness and, and love that, that, that period of time. For my nation, the United States has given uh, additional flying hours for the NATO strategic airlift, their C-7 uh, big transport airplanes, professional military airplanes that belong to NATO, but nations basically control the number of flight hours that can be used for those planes. The US came to the rescue of Romania. Mm. And Secretary Esper, in our defense ministerial meeting by VTC Secure uh, Communication Alliance just last week, mentioned the fact uh, that this is happening. We are not in the business of, of, of telling nations what to do domestically, and even less so to get into domestic politics, especially in an election year in one country or another. But what I'm saying, the NATO is not the first responder. We are not supposed to be doing that. But the moment there is a need for our logistics, for our command and control, for our military personnel to step up our game and be there when our citizens need us most, I think this test mm. is about to be passed uh, in very good conditions by our organization. Of course, there are lots of things that are not under control. There is an, an economic, a social, uh, other components of this crisis. But when it comes to national resilience, to, to lead by example, including the US, I have a regular weekly conference call of coordination with the US under the US uh, initiative with many allies and mm. also to the European Union. We coordinate, and I don't see here a lack of uh, American leadership. We just see an immensely complicated problem that has to be addressed in conditions of dress, of stress, and of course, sometimes uh, with, with politics uh, coming to the forefront. But that's, that's the, the charm of democracies. I would mm -hmm. not like to live in, in, a, in a dictatorship. I've lived for half of my life in communist Romania. Thank you, no, mm. never again. So I prefer sometimes a democratic, uh, tough conversation instead of having a top-down, right. uh, heavy arm of the state telling me what to do. You and I have talked in the past about which global powers are behaving and which global powers are misbehaving. And I'm interested in your view uh, from Brussels uh, and NATO headquarters. What is Russia doing right now? What is China right doing right now? Are there nations that are trying to exploit this moment? Um, and how is NATO responding to that if they are? Listen. Uh Great power competition and uh, competition in general is, is the name of the game uh, since the beginnings of uh, human society being organized. And this will continue as long as we live on this planet or probably on different planets. Um, but what it is very important to know that such difficult circumstances should not be used and abused to really advance your narrow, selfish interest in moment of such difficulty. Of course, as I mentioned, there is a, a natural tendency to look inwards and to look after your own citizen and your national interests. Right. But I personally believe, and we do believe, that this volume, this, this combination of disinformation, fake news, um, uh, conspiracy theories, combined with a, some form of uh, soft power propaganda, what you can call a mask diplomacy, mm. uh, what you can say, mask uh, diplomacy let's say, from China. Uh, a health. Uh, right. Silk and Road initiative. Again, we cannot tell nations not to really, you know, play cards and play ball in this such situations. But I think this is very detrimental to to engage in such in such operations. Um, and there is a deliberate, uh, continuous, and now upgraded uh, effort, especially by by Russia, also uh, sometimes by China to really use this difficult moment to see discord, mistrust, and to weaken our political right. democratic system in the political West. This is something that we have to fight right. back. This is something that we are fighting back. You mentioned the fact that NATO, together with the EU and also with allies, we, we start to, to really tell the truth mm. and also request our citizens. And this is also my personal plea, please, when you really try to get information, go to professional sources, go to Steve Clements, go to people that have a record. And people like, like you, Steve, and like you, you, the publication you're working now and the ones before in your fantastic career. Right. Make sure that you really 
listen and 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 internalize in such difficult moments information that has a little bit at least of double and triple checking like professional journalists do mm. uh, and and this is something right. i believe is very important for us and well, i do believe that we'll get out stronger from this from this uh, fantastic uh, difficult period there will be probably uh, months and years right. uh, to really uh, get back into uh, a new stage but i do believe that this is the moment of test and i think democratic systems with right. all our procrastination with all our sometimes difficulty to reach uh, mm -hmm. fast uh, conclusions that's far better than autocratic systems and i think we will prevail just because open societies can really perform better and adapt better uh, to difficult circumstances that, that any other system. Well, that is a perfect place to end a great conversation. Mircea Gianoa, uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, us a bit of the security, the global security dimensions of the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, now. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, be safe, and we'll see you tomorrow.